Uh, it's me, Coach Josh, coming at you live. Uh, I haven't done a Facebook Live in a long time. I did a Facebook Live telethon. I don't know if telephone. <laughs> yeah, where I uh, answered fitness questions and made stuff up and danced, and it was a fundraiser for our house, actually. Cool. Um, yeah, and then I, I didn't do my research though, because if you if you look at telethons, they didn't go toward like it wasn't the same person talking for like the entire time. Like like uh, the host, uh, who's the guy, Dick Van? Is Dick Van Dyke? No, it was. Uh, uh, I forgot the guy, but uh, he would constantly uh, throw to acts, and like they had musicians and uh, variety acts. And stuff. But he was only on there for like, you know, a half hour every few hours. Yeah. So it was really easy on him. Was it Jerry Lewis? It was Jerry Lewis. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Well, uh, this is not a telethon. This is a discussion that we're having with Dr. Crane um, about uh, stress, gut health, and um, and 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 what you can do about it. And to give you a little background, I'm a, I'm a coach here in uh, Portland, Oregon, in, a, in the fitness and health. And Dr. Crane is a naturopath who specializes and focuses on, um, among uh, other things, the, the GI, GI health. So what's going on in the gut, having um, a healthy the de digestive tract. And now it's an interesting time because I think everybody's literally feeling some guts, uh, gut pain uh, with all of this kind of nauseating amount of change that we're navigating and the pressure um, emotionally, you know, financially, uh, physically, what have you. So um, uh, let's just get right, uh, right into it. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Josh approached me and we to talk today a little bit about stress and how it affects you know, the whole body, but specifically the digestive tract. Um, and I thought that was a really good thing to talk about, like you said, with these times. Um, so really, what is stress, right? So, I mean, stress could be good things, right? Like, like getting married is a stressful event, but it's sometimes people's happiest day of their lives, right? Yeah. Um, so, and then there's it's also... Been for me a couple times. Yeah, <laughs> more than <laughs> once. Um, and then there's the stress that, you know, is negative, that ne negatively impacts our body. Um, and the, tr the tricky thing or the interesting thing is like our body is as smart as they are and as tuned as they are. Um, we don't do a good job differentiating between what is good stress and what is bad stress. So all the same hormones that are released during when we're really happy and stressed out and when we're uh, negatively stressed out are the same and they ultimately have uh, negative consequences on the body. 100%. 100%. And uh, the... One of the things I think people aren't aware of is, and I talked about this yesterday in a, a different conversation, but it was the physiologically the body has no difference between being what, what's the now being chased by a tiger, yeah. and then like being afraid you having your boss yell at you or okay. having a big uh, presentation, yep. right? And the, the in the in the gym, the difference between the the chased by the tiger fear and the you know making the back squat happen or doing a sprint is that intense stress is followed by a compensatory response to the body. So you get all these endorphins and positive hormones that uh, regenerate your tissue and build strength and all those fun things that we train for. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't get that when you're stressed out, sitting at home, watching the news, and slowly having right. a meltdown as, uh, as the world collapses. Right, yeah, when you're, when you're exercising, you, know, you have this compensatory stress or this purposeful stress, and then you have planned time for relaxation and recovery, right? Plan time. We're gonna come back to that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, you do. Where otherwise, you know, if it's if it's one stressor after another, you're never getting that uh, true time to recover, and our body just thinks we're running away from a saber tooth tiger all day long. Right. Hundred percent. So um, on the uh, and on the body and the impact that this has on us physically, from my perspective, I look at breath. Like how we're like how stress affects your breathing, and how um, when you start to breathe more shallow, when you start to have those stress stress breaths, you, you get that ad adrenaline dump. You're in that sympathetic state, and when you're there, um, you're, you you've got uh, more cortisol. You, you're burning a lot of energy, but you're uh, also if for me, and I think everybody sort of responds to stress a little bit differently. When I'm you know in that state, like I go into like definitely a less effective place to think from and to negotiate from, and I get a little panicky um, and uh, sort of almost like a mania, depending on mm -hmm. you know uh, what happens to me. Um, but then that's where like I'll you know I'll skip meals, I'll forget to eat. I just won't be like I won't have good executive function. And um, and then when I'm doing that, now I'm I'm real stressed. I'm not eating well um, or, or enough, 
and so the body's not getting what it needs, and then you know you start to lose muscle, and then you really start to um, blast the metabolism into the wrong direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, that, that, you nailed it. So with the with when we're stressed, where our cortisol levels go up really high, as well as our adrenaline levels, right? And the adrenaline levels is really what makes our heart rate spike. Uh, it makes our breathing more shallow and more rapid. Um, that's what really changes our thoughts to be more frantic and more panicked and not to be as clear. And then those cortisol levels that go up, like you said, not only are, can they be impactful as far as muscle gain and, and, and trying to uh, improve physiology, but the, when our cortisol levels are high, it turns off all of our basic functions. So our immune system, um, like our, our hormonal system, um, you know, and a few other things there too, where it just completely shuts them down. Um, because again, we're just trying to survive that saber tooth tiger attack. So who cares about all those other functions at the same time? Right. Uh, yeah, totally. And, and but that all this all the, all the while though, we are sitting at our desk. Maybe we're working. Maybe we're taking care of our kids or whatever. And then, you know, you're reading a news headline, and we don't really recognize it as a stress. Like we're not thinking about oh, this is putting more pressure on my body. Uh, you might feel the heart rate elevated. You might feel anxiety. But I don't think people equate it as a one for one. But the impacts can be you know tremendous on how. Well, you recover from physical activity. If you're working out in your living room or you're going for a run, like you might not recover as quickly as you as you normally would because you're in this heightened sense of uh, stressful state mm -hmm. uh, for the rest of the day. But let's go back. Let's go right into the, the gut uh, part of this. And so, what is happening for uh, you know for our digestion? What, what's happening in our um, in our, inside our body for uh, people that are in you know still maybe. Uh, exercising and eating relatively well, but like, the, but are still under all the stress. How are that? How is that impacting them? Yeah. So, um, you know, it goes back to that same idea of fight or flight versus rest and digest, right? And it's interesting that we've had that uh, adage for you know as long as I can remember. You know, before I even knew anything about the GI tract, we'd always talk about fight or flight or rest and digest. And really, the the differences between those two things is you know exactly when we're in fight or flight. All of our excitatory, you know, survive for our lives hormones are elevated. Um, but not only that, but all the blood is shunted away from the digestive organs and all of our vital organs to the periphery because, you know, we're ready to run and drop back if we need to. So, um, you know, instead of that blood and, and our immune system and all these other vital functions being in our, our main organs, it's everywhere else and our body's putting the attention to everywhere else. So even though we're eating that really nutritious meal, um, the body's still having, it could be having a harder time breaking it down, assimilating those nutrients, using those things up, um, because the other thing that can happen, again, when that blood is, is moved away, uh, specifically in our small intestine, is we, we develop a larger opening. So instead of everything being nice and tight and firm and the body knows what to do with all the food that's coming through, it kind of gets relaxed and it gets a little more relaxed and can become more open. So the body's not absorbing those nutrients um, and it's going to waste essentially. Interesting. And this is, um, so the nutrients you pull out of the food, the same food that you're eating might change based on your state. Right. Yeah. The other thing too is, you know, as we're in an excitatory state, we're not uh, producing the right levels of stomach acid. Mm. Okay. So, and our stomach acid is one of the things that's really important. It's not only to break down our food into smaller pieces, but having proper stomach acid tells the gallbladder, the pancreas, all these other vital organs, hey guys, food's coming, so they get ready for it. Okay, so we're the mechanics of your insides are not working as well as they normally would. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, as you're as you're going through this, I started to come up with some ideas, but I want to hear from you. So. Um, Let's first let's talk about like what symptoms you'll recognize, and then we'll talk about like what we can do about it. Right, right. So like, so how do you know uh, if your gut, if there's something going on, it's not working correctly? Yeah. So uh, commonly, what I'll see is people either uh, talk about having acid reflux or indigestion after they eat. So they eat and they feel like they're belching, and maybe their food's not sitting right or, or coming back up. Um, some people might feel like they have some abdominal distension or abdominal bloating. So they, they again they eat. Um, and maybe an hour right after eating uh, into the night um, that they just feel more distended and just um, their the clothes that may have fit them in the morning maybe now feel a little bit tighter as yeah. the day goes on. Uh -huh. The other thing too is um, people may uh, have some more constipation like stools so either harder time passing stools or loose stool depending on the person but there's sometimes some change, some change in stool uh, patterns as well. Okay. Uh... That's uh, that's very specific. Now, um, 
Now we're talking about stress. So, um, what, like, what is the? This is just such a crazy time, mm-hmm. and like, I'm operating right now, and I am I'm a, I'm a somewhat high anxiety person. If you if you know me, um, you may or may not find that surprising, but I I have a lot of anxiety, and lately I feel like I'm on a roller. So I work out in the morning. And then that's like, oh, I feel really good. I feel good. And then, but like over the course of the day, I'm like in a, on a, uh, a roller coaster that's climbing mm-hmm. and I can feel the intensity just continually mounting. Yeah. And so, and I, you know, I'm a fitness guy. So I'm like, oh, I have to work out twice a day now. And that's sort of my yeah. thing. So I was like, you know, trying to split it up that way. But um, what are, what are some things that you can do um, to help modify the stress response? manage it better, yeah. think, think, you know, like what's, what's really important? What needs to happen? Yeah. Well, I think the, the first and most important thing is what you just mentioned is just uh, acknowledging that it's happening, right? So for a lot of people, just, uh, just taking that moment of awareness to be like, you know, are my shoulders up here by my ears? Am I just like rushing on to the next task? Um, am I present in what I'm currently doing, right? Am I breathing? Am I taking a few deep breaths? Uh, really basic, I tell people usually start with, uh, I say, doorknobs, lights, light switches, and faucets. So anytime you either turn off a light or leave a room, uh, walk, turn on a faucet to wash your hand, or Which open we are the all door, doing. 30 seconds, sing your favorite song. Um, again, just check in on those things. Like every time we, you, you go and wash your hands, like while you're washing your hands, are my shoulders up here by my ears? Am I breathing? Am I, am I thinking about what I'm doing right now? Or am I like five steps ahead, thinking about someone four states away, like, you know, all over the place? That alone is like the, one of the biggest, uh, you know, biggest pieces of trying to help control our stress. And just taking that moment to stop and acknowledge, it. am I under stress? Man, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Uh, I mean, it, it, it can be tough, and I think just as tough as then doing something about it. Mm-hmm. So, like, I really enjoy working, and one of the things that I'm realizing is like, I I just have just a short, a little less capacity than I would like, and so I can't work as long hours, which is hard because I. Right now, um, you know, in the fitness industry, it's a very uh, challenging time, and it, there's a lot of change. So, uh, you know, aggressive action is yeah. required, yeah. and so I want to stay on top of it. And yet, um, like every time I try to redline it or go go a little bit further, I just you know, I mm-hmm. can trigger a panic attack, or you know, my sleep will be really affected, which messes me up the next day. Right, right. So, um, so let's say you acknowledge you're you, you're getting that stress, then like, what do you what do you do about it? How do you curb the, curb the, dole the, the thrust there. Yeah, yeah. Well, some things that you've talked about and, and you shared with me, I know, are some different stretches and different um, exercises that you can do to actually help decrease stress levels. I know I say that, but is that really helpful? You know, for some people, I mean, the first thing that I always say and I always ask people, I'm like, well, what do you do for stress management, right? And they say, you know, I, I exercise, I, I meditate, um, I could do it more though, and, and my, my next question is, well, do you enjoy doing it? Yeah, and does it help? Yeah. And, and, if, and if their answer is no to, to either of those, then I'm like, okay, then we need to find something different for you to be doing. Right. Right? Right. Um, and that's, uh, that's so interesting. Um, I'm, a big, I'm big into journaling right now. And um, like uh, the, I think everybody thinks like this who finds something that works for them. Like, does this really not work for other people? It's like, man, if I want to sleep, boom, journal, five minutes later, I'm asleep. You know, if I'm having a stress up time and I, I can I can journal it out or just write out my thoughts, I always feel better. I'm like, come on, it's a silver bullet. Every but but you're saying that like you gotta make you gotta go to what your kind of your mind is asking for right. you, your body, what right. you like, what, right. what makes you feel good. Yeah, for some people I mean like that's why people pick up knitting or that's why people pick up I mean I I like doing crossword puzzles that really helps just kind of bring down my awareness and brings me into just what I'm doing and not focusing about other things going going on in my life. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, and then so just trying enough things to figure out what those things are. Right. You know, it's like you know, if you tried, you know, knitting a while back, try it again. Yeah. Try meditation. Try it again. Right. Try and try something new. Right. Don't stop the rut. Right. And and even with a lot of those those different things, you know, I I always tell people, oh, I, you know, people are like, oh, I tried it once and it wasn't for me. But that totally can be right. But you know, the the way I compare it is like, we've ever had a bad haircut, right? If you ever have a bad haircut, it doesn't mean you'll never get your hair cut ever again. Maybe for some people it will, <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's a matter of just trying different, different techniques, different approaches, different teachers, different trainers, things like that to, you know, see if there's something you actually like to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, what are the, so like you're, you know, someone who's having 
trouble digesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe their um, their their appetite suppressed, or they're they're having some GI issues. What are the questions you're going to ask them when they get in front of you? Yeah. So um, if people are coming to me with GI, GI issues, the you know the first thing I try to figure out is for how long they've been going on. Um, and then a lot of the other things I'm trying to figure out is patterns, right? So do these issues change with meals? Do these issues change with exercise? What have people tried to do, right? A lot of times when people are having digestive issues, the first thing that they do, because it's sometimes the easiest thing for them to do, is they try to eliminate certain foods in their diet. So they, they do their own like food allergy elimination, so they try to cut out some of the big, bigger, more typical allergen foods like dairy or eggs or soy or um, you know, grains or whatever it has to be, um, to see if that causes the problem. So I ask people what they've tried already, right? What kind of workup they've done already? Um, and that usually can give me some clues of what can be causing their digestive issues. Yeah. Okay. And you, you said that how long has it been going on? It's been a, a big one. Um, so it's something, uh, is it, do you, you treat them differently if something has been going on for like five or 10 years versus something that's been like the last 60 days? Right, instance? right. And the other reason I ask that question is because sometimes uh, the reason why people know how long it's been going on for is there's like a, an inciting trigger right at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. I got, I was in Mexico and I got sick and I've never been to quite the right sense. Or mm -hmm. I got into a car accident and I have never been quite the right sense. I had a death in the family have never uh, been quite right since. So that's one of the big key reasons why I ask that is because yeah. sometimes I'll explore more around the timing of, of what happened during that. But then also, yes, yeah, so depending on if it's, hey, it's been a week or hey, it's been five years since I've had a normal bowel movement, you know, I might approach that and, and treat the person a little bit differently. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's like so often too in, in fitness, it's like people know what their issues are. They don't mean know how to tackle them, mm -hmm. but they like, they know. Yep. Uh, that's that's good. Using the person as a resource. Yeah, um, and even myself, like sometimes when I'm, uh, you know, s stumped, and maybe see someone a few a few times, I oh, I usually ask patients like, what do you think it is? Like, what do you think is going on? I mean, they're the ones that are laying awake at night or yeah, with their belly aching and yeah, they never have a lot of those. They they are one of the things that you know pain does is that you are present. You are very present when you're going through that. Yeah. Uh, because if you could ignore it, you would. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Um, Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a bit on the diagnosis end. And then uh, I guess uh, we're running through ideas to manage um, uh, uh, stress. And we talked about exercise and journaling and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you wanted to talk about sleep. So how does, this, how does sleep affect the GI tract? Yeah, so um, at night when we're sleeping is when the majority of our immune system does its job. Um, and specifically in the GI tract, we have what we call the migrating motor complex. Um, oh yeah, I think we've all heard of that. Oh, exactly. And that, that acts as this housekeeping wave, like the, the cleaner uppers of the digestive tract that come in, you know, usually about four hours after we're done eating, and it moves all the waste products, all the dead, all the dead immune cells, everything else through the digestive tract, um, and so into the stool, so we can we can you know move them out, remove this waste. Um, also, you know, a, a term that a lot of people have heard is things called neurotransmitters, right? Yep. So it's like our serotonin and our dopamine and all these things that make us feel really good and feel really happy. Um, turns out, all those are made in the GI tract as well, mm. um, and they're majorly made while we're sleeping. Hmm. Um, so when it comes to muscle repair and energy repair and things like that, a lot of those hormones are made at night while we're sleeping. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes. I mean, that makes sense. Sleep, sleep. Uh, and I talk about this a lot. It's a big emphasis, uh, especially now. But it's the biggest performance enhancing drug you can take. It's free and it literally upregulates all the good stuff in your in your brain and your body. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, and then stress stress management or stress improvement strategies. Obviously, there's a there's a bunch. There's hundreds of best practices. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, I've been a big fan of um, you know taking supplements for this. And I want to know what your thoughts are. Is that if I take something like melatonin or some sort of a you know an herbal or mineral or whatever, does that um, is that is that bad for me or good for me in the long run or is it ma does it matter if I use those or right? No, I mean I I like to tell people if it works for you, great, like stick with it. Okay, right. Um, you know the first thing I'm always going to try with people is what I consider to be called sleep hygiene. 
sleep hygiene means things like you know how late are we on our phones or, or watching TV right before we go to bed. Uh, the blue light that comes off of TVs uh, stimulates our, our cortisol, our awakening hormone, uh, versus a red light, that's why the sky turns red when the sun sets, uh, stimulates melatonin or those things that people, some people take for sleep aids. So, you know, how long people on screens before they're going to bed is a great place to start. Is yeah. your room dark? Is your room comfortable? Is your room very loud, right? Um, do you have your dog sleeping on your feet that you can kick them off every five minutes? Things along those lines. Sure. But um, no, uh, sleep aids are a, a great way um, to try to help people get not only uh, uh, quantity of sleep, so hours, but um, quality of sleep, so actually getting that rest and repair. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I totally with you. And I think like just to you know plug it one more time, exercise also helps sleep. Um, Tremendously. Be, being fatigued, um, the the hormones uh, involved. Uh, it's it's just uh, there's no downside to exercise typically unless you're trying to run on a road bike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Right. Right. Um, okay. So then, um, one of the things that uh, you, you'd also mention was the idea of stress versus burnout. And um, I think that's really interesting, and I have no idea what that your definition of burnout is. I'm kind of want to get that from you. Yeah. So for me, how I define the two of those things is, you know, usually with stress, again, like we talked about, like maybe our heart rate, heart rate is increased, um, our breathing is increased, but it's usually for a short period of time. Um, burnout tends to be uh, maybe stressful situations or, or situations that make us not feel great about ourselves over longer periods of time to the point where we become, you know, maybe have more lethargy or more have more apathy to what we're doing. So instead of just being like, oh my gosh, like this task makes me feel like stresses me out. It's, I don't want to do this. I hate doing this. It, it, it just like weighs on me. Um, anytime I think about it, even if I'm not doing it. And those are usually more indicative of things like burnout. Yeah. Okay. So it's um, the. Is it something that built, uh, it can it be caused by like a one-time shock, shocking event, or is it something that like mounts up over time and builds up like a debris pile? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the the most common place that we think about things like burnout is from like schooling or from jobs, right? So going to the same job or going to you know a rigorous school program every single day, and we're working. You know, long hours with a, not a ton of rest in between it, and you know, think about that causing burnout. Yeah. Okay. But awesome. for some people too, it's like you know, it could just be the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so in 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 the physical world, it's called overtraining, and like when like the clinical version of over, overtraining is when you're in the, there's when the compensatory response no longer occurs, meaning. You go for your run, and you were in, instead of recovering and coming back stronger with your cardiovascular fitness or your your, your muscles that you're training, it actually gets worse. Mm -hmm. It gets worse because you're not getting that anabolic response. You're not building up any muscle. You're not. You're, it it, it kind of comes from the central nervous system as a sudden sort of overload um, place because you do want to overtax a muscle to train it because then then it grows. But if you are consistently overloaded what happens is your body just stays in that fatigue state and you're not, you're not producing anything. And it takes quite some time to recover from because yeah. it's more of a deeper issue than just being tired. Right, you right. Um, how, do you, how do you counsel those people that maybe use exercise as a stress reduction technique but maybe have done it to the point, like you said, maybe as their stress levels increase, they feel like they need to um, increase their exercise amount, right? Mm -hmm. Because they know that's a good coping skill for them, but they get to the point where maybe they exercise too much, but at this place of possible, you know, like fatigue from exercising too much, but yet they know that they need some sort of movement to help them. Well, there's this really great line from a, a, a bodybuilder that I got, I keep, it's, it's an old, it's a guy from the 90s, but I'll, I'll go look it up online. I, it was one of the first podcasts I listened to when I was a young trainer, and this guy was saying, I don't believe in overtraining, I believe in under recovering. So he would go to bed an hour earlier than his friends, and he would do two a days, and they're all bodybuilders, they're working all the time. Um, but he was, he, you know, he needed an extra meal, he'd get an extra hour of sleep, he just, he just layered these extra strategies on there so that he was recovering from the second workout while they were sort of going to the club, getting burned out, not sleeping, drinking too much. And so when I think about, if you're an over-exerciser or an exerciser who's really taken it to the nth level at this moment, what you do is for every every 
workout that you add, so let's say you're working out six days a week, now you're going to seven or eight, you're, going, you're doing a couple two a days, you're doing a strength training workout and then a run or whatever you're doing. Every time you add something, you have to add in some recovery. So if you're gonna add another workout in, add some calories. If you're gonna add another workout in, add a massage. If you're, I mean, now is probably not a good time to get a massage, but um, add in some time in the pool or uh, some time in the hot tub. You know, add in some extra 15 minutes of sleep every night, you know, so it just incrementally increase the exercise, increase the recovery, so that you're not just burning the candle at both ends. Because you just, if you just take away and you own team, you never add, you're gonna run out of you're gonna run out of them. Yeah. So and then that's the also that's the secret that's the way by the way, that's what professional athletes do, right? They when they're in season, they stop training because the game the game load is so high, they stop doing uh, strength training, they just do skill practice to maintain and, and so but they're they, they modify what they're doing to match their pace of life. Mm -hmm. Right? And so uh, uh, you know just about any athlete they eat to re they're eating on purpose to recover all the time. So yeah. it's, it's got to be forefront. You have to have both. Yeah, yeah. Because one thing that I, I see with, in my patients, so again, with these patients that I see that have had digestive issues for a few years, one of the things I ask them about is history of over exercising or over training. Mm -hmm. um, because, like you said, often I'm finding people that haven't taken that extra time to recover or haven't uh, brought in that extra fuel to help refuel their body after over exercising. So people that may go to like back-to-back -to -back hot yoga classes or people who are doing strength training on top of weightlifting, on top of marathon uh, training and they're not, you know, feeling their body. And two things that I'm finding kind of the same thing with that fight, it's triggering that fight or flight where the blood is no longer the digestive organs and it's being pushed out to the periphery. The digestive organs is, are starved of nutrition, starved of all the things they need to just do their basic surviving for hours and hours on a daily basis. And the other thing that, you know, I'm sure that you see in, in, in your industry, and I see myself too, is people you, relying on things like um, ibuprofen or Tylenol, specifically uh, ibuprofen, yeah, to help with, to speed up the recovery instead of actually doing the, the care pieces, and then we know the effects of that can have on the digestive tract too. Oh, yeah, yeah, and so it's, um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it, exactly right, right? So anytime you're, like, you can't, you can augment recovery, but you can't shortcut it. So there's no drug that you can take outside of, you know, juice, you know, test raw <laughs> testosterone, which does help, uh, as we all know. Stay off the juice, kids. Yeah, stay off the juice. Um, but uh, if you think about, like, what I think a lot of people expect to have happen in the context of, like, weight loss is if I increase, if I step on the training, if I just keep, you know, if I do sprints and I lift and I go for long runs and I do this, I think like, it's the energy the, the energy's got to come from somewhere. It will. It will come from your muscles. Your body's only going to give up so much of its long-term storage. And so, it, it, you know, if it works. They're like, the body's shocked. You lose some weight. You feel good about yourself. Your body fat percentage drops. And then it stops because without putting that fuel in there, the body's going to hold on. And it's going to burn up the amino acids in your muscles. It's going to take, you know, you're going to get those calories from somewhere. You're absolutely right. Just not where you want them. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is when our cortisol levels go up and our stress levels, it, it triggers something in the body called gluconeogenesis. And what that basically means is it, it pulls uh, sugar you know, out of the body to be used as fuel. But our, again, our body doesn't know that we're just sitting at our computer answering emails and we don't actually need that circulating sugar uh, as fuel. So then we go and eat our lunch on top of that or whatever else it is and now our body is just storing that as extra sugar and extra calories. Um, and that's why often people that have high stress levels or you know, high cortisol levels tend, tend to gain weight more easily wow. also. That's how you get the diabetes. Um, I'm going to check out our questions, see if we got any posted, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Wow, we got a lot of people tuning in from all over the all over the world. Wow. Oh, excellent. All over the world. Yeah. Megan, can cortisol be a contributing factor in my neck pain? Is it from being hunched? Um, but you know, what, what? How else does that affect me? Yeah, cortisol in general is inflammatory. So uh, cortisol um, is an inflammatory cause of a lot of different pains. You know, um, you know, one of the bigger things that we do see right now, and I'm sure Josh can attest this too, is again people sitting on their phones, sitting on their keyboards, driving their cars. Right, we're just in this position all day long with our neck forward. Um, our shoulders not stacked on top of each other, it's just stretched out. No. So, see that really commonly as a contributing as well for, for the augment might. Yeah, as everyone sits up, sits up straighter. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yep. 
Uh, well, um, thank you so much for tuning in, uh, everybody. I appreciate the, 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 the waves, the questions. Um, we will take the, the download of this and we'll post it online and we'll send out a link to our uh, respective audiences. And, um, and we'll, we'll do this again. We'll, get, we'll, we'll gather some more questions and then we'll, we'll get rolling. But um, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time, Doc. Thanks for uh, getting the word out about this and um, trying to help people out. Thank you. You are so welcome. Fun, fun.